Today we are continuing in our sermon series called Brass Tacks, and this is all based on our theme verse, which is in your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull that out and read this theme verse with us. This is John 16, 25. We've been reading this each week. I've been using figures of speech with you. The time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in such analogies. Instead, I will tell you plainly about the Father. This is late in Jesus' ministry when he decides he's going to speak plainly to the disciples, and he's going to stop talking in parables, and he's just going to tell them straight up what they need to know. And in that vein, we have endeavored in this series to speak plainly. This is our stewardship series. Every year we talk about money for four weeks, and we often overcomplicate things. Money, church, faith, all kinds of things. And so we wanted to speak plainly and directly to be as clear as we can. So in week one, we talked about the simple truth that if you don't control your own money, it will control you. Scripture says you cannot serve two masters. Last week, we talked about what our resources can do when we put them to work in the kingdom of God. When we devote our time, our energy, and our resources to God's work, amazing things are possible. And today, we're going to talk about what really matters in our life, the things that live on beyond us, our legacy, what we're remembered for, the things that truly define our life, and the things that don't, that sometimes we spend time chasing. Our scripture verse for today comes from Mark's gospel, right in the very middle, the 8th chapter of Mark, and this is starting in verse 34. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, speak to us plainly today. As we remember the saints, let us also pay attention to what matters in our own lives. How will we be remembered? What are the things that we chase? What is the purpose of our life? God, help us to reflect honestly with ourselves, to be honest with you, and to listen to your gospel this morning. Lord, speak through me, and we will listen. For this is your house, and we are your people, and we trust you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. This text from Mark is the first message that Jesus really gives to the crowds after he has one of the most meaningful conversations in all of Scripture with his disciples. Just a few verses earlier in the 8th chapter of Mark, Jesus has this iconic conversation with his disciples where he asks them, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? You've been walking with me for a few years now. What's our reputation? Who do people think I am? And they say, well, they think you're a prophet or you're Elijah, and they kind of give some examples. And he says this famous question, what about you? What about you, Andrew? What about you, Peter? Who do you say that I am? And they all freeze. And Peter says, I think you're the Messiah. And this is the first time that Jesus really acknowledges that and tells them, yes, he is the Messiah. The one that Isaiah was talking about hundreds of years ago, 800 years ago, I'm that guy. I am the Messiah. It's really the first time that he openly says that to the disciples. But he knows they don't get it, so he tells them, don't talk about this yet. You don't understand what that means, but you need to know this is who I am, and we're going to be moving in this new direction. And everything in Mark's gospel pivots around this conversation. The eighth chapter of Mark is right in the middle. Mark has 16 chapters. And in the first eight, he's walking away, and he's journeying out into the areas, and he's preaching, and he's healing. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of joy. And then in Mark 8, he has this very serious conversation where he reveals his purpose to the disciples. And from then on, Scripture will say he set his face toward Jerusalem, and he was about his work in Jerusalem. And his tone changes. He starts talking about very serious matters of life and death. He begins speaking very directly and very plainly to the disciples. 
we see Jesus trying to petition the disciples in the crowd to focus on what matters most, on abundant life and on serving others, not serving ourselves. Because we love to serve ourselves. That is a part of the human condition. Fame, power, and wealth were just as strong of a draw 2,000 years ago as they are today. That's why Jesus is constantly preaching about serving other people. We've always been this way. We've always felt that the way to find joy and happiness in life is to accrue fame, power, and wealth, to get what's good for us. That's always been true of humanity. And so Jesus constantly talks about it over and over. There are so many examples of Jesus preaching this message of humility and serving others. He says, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Don't, if you want to save your life, you have to lose your life. Don't store treasures up on earth. Don't build bigger barns for your stuff. Even the Son of God came to serve and not be served. There is no greater love than to lay down your life for one another. Sell all your possessions and give to the needy. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Love even your enemies and bless those who persecute you. I could go on and on and on. All of those are the words of Christ. And he sounds like a broken record because we're pretty thick-headed. And he kept trying to drive this into our skull that the way you find happiness and joy and abundant life is not by trying to serve yourself and get everything for yourself and gain power and wealth and status, but it's to serve others, to live with your hands open, not clenched very tightly around what you have. Jesus was seemingly obsessed with this message because he knew it's what we struggle with the most. And that's why he talked about money so much. I say this every year in stewardship, that Jesus talks about money more than almost anything else. Scripture talks about money over 2,000 times. And the reason is not because money is evil. It's not because Jesus was trying to raise cash for something. It's because Jesus knew that we struggle with this. Money, possessions, wealth, fame, things to make our lives better, we love to focus on. We love chasing these things, and Jesus knew in the end we would lose everything if we chase that. It's the whole point of today's text. Verse 36 says it best, and I'm sure this is the verse that you've heard the most of this text. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and lose their soul? What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Jesus was very worried that we were going to focus on these self-serving things, make our life about ourselves, and in the process, lose our soul. So what are we supposed to do? If we're not supposed to do that, what are we supposed to do? Well, Jesus always tells us, and in this verse, he says, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Which doesn't sound very cheerful, right? That's a hard message to sell. Why should you follow Jesus? Well, because you get to carry your own cross. Doesn't that sound great? Well, that didn't work out so well for Jesus, so no, I don't think I want to do that. What does this mean to deny ourselves and take up our cross? Most of all, I think that it means to invest in others, to put others first, to pour our time and our energy and our love into something besides just ourselves and our own family and our own careers and outside of just our own world into others, to invest in others. So today I want to talk to you about two ways that we can invest in others. And since it's stewardship, the first one's obvious. One way that we invest in others is by contributing here at the church. In your bulletin, you received a stewardship commitment card. We fill these out every year. These are something that we use for two reasons. One, it's simply a tool that we use to help us write our budget. Just like you look at your income before you buy a house or buy a car, we like to know an estimate, a general idea of what the church will receive in income when we look to how we're going to spend money every year. We want to make sure that we're not going into debt, that we are honoring the gifts that you give us. Our church is entirely self-funded by the generosity of everyone in this room. Our church pays for all of our ministries ourselves, and has always done so faithfully. For almost 70 years, do you all know that next year is 70 years that Ridgewood Park has existed? That is incredible joy. And we stand here today as a debt-free church because of the faithfulness of all of you. We have always responded to this call. So one of the reasons that we do this is just as a simple tool so we can understand how to set our budget for next year so we don't get into hot water financially. The other reason we do this is that it's a way to make a commitment to one another to say, I'm in this with you. 
I'm a part of this team, I love this place, and I'm all in. We live in a world that hates commitment. We won't even sign up for a two-year contract for a cell phone anymore. Everything is month to month. We have like commitment issues as a society. But God is all about committing to us. We are in a covenant relationship with God. God is always promising things and in a covenant committed relationship with us. And so God asks us to live in the same way, to invest in something, to commit to something. So on this card, you're going to see some helpful tips on the front. If you have never given before, then start in step one. Just try to make a gift to the church and see how it feels. Find where you are on this. Generosity is a lifelong journey, and we always try to encourage people, try to move up just one step. See if you can make that shift next year. If you um, have made a plan to give to the church in the past, maybe you filled out a card last year, try giving through an automated giving. Set it up automatically so you never forget it. You can set it and forget it like any other bill. Commit to giving a percent of your income and then try to increase that next year. There are small steps that we go through in the way that we increase our generosity and our faithfulness. Those are wonderful ways that we support the ministry of the church. And so I'd encourage you to take this home this week and pray over it. Talk to your spouse, talk to your kids if they're age-appropriate. Have that open conversation of what you want to do to support the ministries of God here at Ridgewood Park in 2024. And this is not a commitment, right? This isn't a bank note. We ask for a signature on the back, but it's not legally binding. We look for an estimate. And this primarily for most people stays the same from year to year. Maybe it shifts a little bit here and there. But if you know that your finances are going to change drastically in the next year, maybe you got a new job, you lost a job, you're retiring, you hit the $1.75 billion lotto, we all want to know those things. But it's good to know if you know that your giving is going to change drastically in either direction, it helps us to have a heads up as we move into the next year. And so I'd encourage you to pray over this. Next Sunday, we're going to turn these in all together. And as I say every year, I make this promise to you, I will never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And so my card will be the first one in. We love this church. We have such a home here. We love all of you deeply. We will always be committed with you. That's next week. There's an online version of it as well, and we'll, of course, accept the cards for several weeks afterward if you're going to be out of town next week. That's one way that we invest in others. We invest in the work of the local church here at Ridgewood Park with our time, our energy, and our money because God changes lives through the church. But the second way we invest in others is with our time. There are so many people who change our lives because they invest their time in us. They spend time with us. They commit to supporting us and loving us and being there. The first person that always comes to mind for me is a pastor in San Antonio named James Amerson. James has been a mentor of mine for about 20 years now. Uh, when I was a teenager, he saw something in me that I never would have seen myself. He came up to me and he said, I see the gifts of God in you. And I said, you got the wrong guy, buddy. No, thanks. But he kept checking on me, and he kept calling me, and he kept supporting me, and he kept encouraging me, and he kept kicking me in the butt when I needed it. He has been an incredible mentor of mine for 20 years. And 10 years ago, when I was ordained, he was one of the two pastors who put the stole on my shoulders, which is one of the most sacred moments for a pastor. You work through all your education, and you finally become ordained. And clergy who have come before you put that red stole of Pentecost on your shoulders in front of all your peers in the whole annual conference. And in that moment, I looked up to James, and I realized I wouldn't have been standing there if 10 years before he hadn't seen some teenager and invested time in him and supported him and loved him and kept pestering him and pestering him and pestering him. James changed my life in so many ways. I am a part of James' legacy. And because he and others have mentored me so well, and I've been impacted by so many mentors in my life, I want to do that for other people. And so I work to try to devote a lot of my time to helping and guiding and mentoring and teaching others just like I was given that gift. And there are generations of pastors that are impacted by James Amerson because he impacted me and he formed me to be someone who cares for others. And his, his legacy will live on for generations and generations to come. I am standing here today because of people like James who invested their time in me. Because that's, what, that's all it takes, investing your time and energy in others. And friends, there are opportunities to invest in other people all the time. 
We just have to be paying attention to them and say yes. And that's the hardest part, is to say yes when they happen upon us. And they happen all the time. One happened to me last night. So we have three children, and my oldest, my six-year-old, um, wanted to go to, uh, wanted to come to um, church with me this morning. My wife is a pastor at University Park, and our kids kind of go back and forth. And we were planning for him to go with Emma today. And he's like, well, I want to go to Dad's church. And we were like, well, yeah, you have to because you're giving the sermon. You're preaching tomorrow. And he was like, what does that mean? Or like, you get up and you give the speech like Dad does at church. And he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> We don't think anything of it. We eat dinner. He goes off. We're doing bedtime, taking a bath, comes back, and, and he says, okay, now, Mom, tomorrow when I preach, here's what I think I want to say. <laughs> and Emma was like, oh, buddy, we were just kidding. His face changed. His shoulders dropped, and he started to cry. And Emma looked at me, and she said, oh, no, what do we do? <laughs> and I said, well, I... I don't think I can let him preach. It's All Saints Sunday. <laughs> what can we do? We said, you know what, buddy? Let's, tomorrow's, it's in the morning. It's really quick. How about we make a plan, and in a week, you can do something in church? He's like, yeah, maybe I can do one of the readings or something. I was like, yeah, whatever will get us to a place where you, I don't feel like a bad father. Like, wh whatever we need to do in this moment, let's, let's do it. So, friends, Henry is going to do something next Sunday. I don't know what it's going to be, okay? But Henry's going to do something next Sunday. And in that moment, I realized, like, this is an... Emma looked at me, and I was like, we have to say yes to this. Oh, my God, we have to do something in this moment. But I wanted to just say, no, Henry, come on. No, it's not Children's Sunday. Like, we need to go to bed. Don't guilt me into this. We were just making a dumb joke. And I wanted to just move past it. And Emma looked at me, and she was like, we can't do that. And it's little moments like that. Because you know what really matters in my life? Seeing that look of hope on his face. He wanted to do something for other people. The courage it takes for a six-year-old to stand up in front of people and want to do that. Now, we'll see if he chickens out. But in that moment, I thought, this is it. This is the kind of thing that people said yes when I said I wanted to do stuff. When I was 15 and I said I wanted to preach, some questionably wise pastor said yes and let me do it. And here I am today. Now, do I think Henry is going to become a preacher? Heck yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> But it's moments like that where I realize I have to say yes to this. Friends, our legacy is defined by the things that we say yes to, the things we do for others. It's defined by the lives we impact, not how successful we are or wealthy we are or famous we are or how many likes that viral video got that we posted, but by the lives we transform when we deny ourselves and invest in others. When Christy read those names today, the All Saints names today, the members of our church who have passed away in the last year, we remembered our friends. We remember the impact they had on our life. But what do we remember about them? Not their salary or the size of their house or their job title, the awards that they won. We don't remember any of that. We remember the way they made us feel, the way they loved us, the way that they supported us, the way they were there for us. We remember the way that they were. And that's why we celebrate this day. I'm standing here today because of the saints who invested in me, who cared for me, who supported me, who encouraged me, who kept me on the journey when I wanted to quit. I'm here because of people like James. I'm here because there were members of my church growing up in First United Methodist Church of Pflugerville, Texas, who decided they wanted to make a commitment to come to the youth group regularly, to go on the trips, to make these relationships with teenagers and support them and love them. So when I got into trouble and I needed someone to call, and I didn't want to call my parents, I could call my Sunday school teacher. I could call Joel, who was at youth group every Sunday, because I knew he wouldn't judge me, and he would love me, and he would support me, because Joel decided to say yes and show up to youth every Sunday. That's all he did, just his time. He committed his time and invested that in me, and I still remember his name today. Think about the people who have had the greatest impact on your life. It probably wasn't their net worth or their number of Instagram followers or their job title that changed your life. But most of us spend our time chasing those things. We spend our time chasing the things that won't stand the test of time, and we can't take any of it with us. Somebody once told me, you know, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. I thought, you know, I haven't either. We can't take it with us when we go, but we can leave a legacy of love. We can, we can transform lives when we put others first and serve God in humility. Friends, that's what we're called to do. 
to invest in others. It's what Jesus told us to do over and over and over and over again all throughout Scripture. And it's the whole point of why we're here. Because after all, what gain is it? What good is it to gain the whole world if we lose our soul? That's the message of hope that Christ wanted us to hear. It's the message of hope he wanted his disciples to hear. And it's the message of hope that transforms each and every one of us as we live in a world that tells us to do the opposite. What good is it to gain the whole world if we lose our soul? Friends, eternal, abundant life is what we're chasing. And we do that by looking to others, by serving and loving, by having that impact on other people as they have had on us. And that's how we transform the world together. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the saints in our lives who have changed and transformed us. For the mentors and the teachers and the parents and the siblings and the coaches. For those people who have invested time and energy into us. For the saints who committed their resources to build buildings like this church. Who showed up and served and loved and cared. Called us when we needed help. Coached us taught us life lessons, the people who shaped us and formed us. God, you call us to be that to others. So help us, O Lord, to invest in the things that really matter, to pay attention to this countercultural narrative that is just as countercultural today as it was 2,000 years ago, to not focus on fame and wealth and status and accruing more for me and my family and my life and my career and my house, but to look to the needs of others. God, help us to keep our soul, to fix our eyes on the things that matter most so that you can continue to transform lives through us. God, help us, because this is one of the hardest things, and we hear thousands of messages every day that tell us to do the opposite. So may we be people who look to others and say yes. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.